He was the first European scholar to delve into Confucianism. He was the first Christian missionary to settle in China. He traveled thousands of miles to come to China, building a bridge of communication. From Macau, he made his way north to Jiaoqing, Shaozhou, Nanchang, and Nanjing, all the way to the destination he had dreamed of, Beijing. Once in China, he would never leave it. He was the Jesuit father, Matteo Ricci. Today, Macau is much quieter than neighboring Hong Kong. But in the 16th and 17th centuries, Macau was for around a hundred years the hub of trade between China, Europe, and Latin America. It was one of the busiest cities in East Asia. For much of history, China and Europe had looked towards each other and wondered. In 1511, the Portuguese finally sailed through the Strait of Malacca and saw China. They were eager to visit the magical land of gold and spices reported by Marco Polo. In the mid-16th century, the Portuguese established a presence in Macau, arguing that they needed to allow their wet goods to dry. Then came Catholic missionaries, opening a new era of Sino-European contact exchange and integration. Because他一直想跟中国要做生意 the ultimate goal of the Catholic missionaries in Macau was to preach in the heartland of China. The most successful of them was undoubtedly an Italian, Matteo Ricci. St. Anthony's, Macau, stands on the site of a chapel built by missionaries in 1558. It has twice burnt down and twice been rebuilt. Mass is being celebrated, as it has been for hundreds of years. Matteo Ricci probably worshipped here in his time. The Jesuits, or the Society of Jesus, were committed to undertaking missionary work abroad. With approval and funding from the King of Portugal, they used Macau as their center of missions in the East. From Macau, they sent missionaries to lands across Asia. Matteo Ricci was one of them. Matteo Ricci joined the Society of Jesus in Rome, aged 19. In 1577, he sailed for India, first to Goa and then to Cochin, where he completed his studies and was ordained. He arrived in Macau on the 7th of August, 1582. There, his first task was to learn Chinese. He found it very challenging, but he was determined to master it. He wrote to his former teacher of rhetorical studies about his progress. The fact is, Chinese is more difficult to learn than Greek or German. It has a great many homophones. The structure of Chinese characters is very difficult to describe unless you see them with your own eyes and write them in your hand as we are learning to do. I really don't know where to start. After a period of study, Father Ricci made great progress with his Chinese, but he was still unable to enter China. What was the problem? 
呃，对外的这个政策呢，呃，随着有海上势力的综合下西洋以后出现的这个状况呢，就是中国本来在这个允诺宣德这一段这一段时间是，呃，对外开放的形式比较大，但到了后来，由于海上的这个民间走私特别强大，所以中国政府开始再加上这个倭寇倭寇的势力啊，海上海患强大以后呢。这个海禁逐渐逐渐加严。Since the Ming government had closed the borders, missionaries could not enter China for a time. In 1552, the year in which Matteo Ricci was born, Francis Xavier, another pioneering Jesuit, succumbed to illness on Shangchuan Island off Guangdong. Without ever seeing China open up, late in the summer of 1583, Father Ricci's chance suddenly came. His fellow Jesuit Michele Ruggieri was in charge of Catholic missions in China, and his polished manners had made a good impression on Chinese officials. The prefect of Guangzhou and Guangxi granted Ruggieri's request for him and his companions to enter the Chinese mainland. So Francis Xavier's dream was fulfilled three decades after his passing. Ruggieri and Ricci immediately began preparing to set sail to China. In order to be accepted there. The two Jesuits made some important changes. They wanted the Chinese to treat them as foreign monks, so they took off their habits and put on Buddhist robes. Nor did they speak of their evangelizing mission for fear of immediate expulsion. It was a dangerous but exciting journey, and it would prove to be a critical moment for Matteo Ricci. He was to devote his whole life to the land where he was about to set foot. After great efforts, Father Ricci finally arrived in Zhaoqing, the seat of the prefect of Guangdong and Guangxi. This was his first stop in China proper. How is it that Father Ricci? 就就是讲，我来这里要传教，我要想传教收到效果，我要走什么路线？最佳的途径，我直接给我们当地的广东的最高当局接触。那么当然，一下子就是，我想，如果那时候两广总督是在地不在，赵庆在广州，他就到广州。Chaoqing was not Marco Polo's wondrous land of gold and spices, but Father Ricci was surprised by the abundance of its produce, the fertile land, and the beauty of the landscape. From the moment he embarked on his journey to Chaoqing, he realized that his future life would be extraordinary. Twenty-five years later, in 1608, he would write to Father Fabio de Fabi. The Chinese do not trust any foreign powers. They do not permit foreigners to enter China. The only exception being missionaries like ourselves, who do not intend ever to return to Europe. So, my beloved father, there is no hope of us meeting again until we meet in another realm. The two missionaries were received by Wang Pan, the prefect of Zhaoqing, and other local officials. Ricci presented the prefect with gifts, but most of them were returned. Nevertheless, the Chinese, including the prefect, were fascinated by the chiming clock they had in their residence. It was quite unlike any traditional Chinese clock. The prefect requested that Father Ruggieri go to Macau. 
to order him an identical Western clock. Instead, the two missionaries brought back a foreign clockmaker. With the assistance of two Chinese artisans, he made a chiming clock. The scientific and technical skills that Father Ricci had learned during his studies at the Jesuits' Roman College now came in very handy. Western artifacts, such as the clock, opened doors for him in China. Jing 如果能在中国的领土上建立他们的一个天主堂，那中国的内地建立他们的一个基地，那他们在表明了天主教在中国已经立下了主。The officials allowed fathers Rogieri and Ricci to choose a piece of land to build a residence. They chose a spot on the west bank of the Xijiang River and built a two-story house and chapel. Once the chapel was built, the prefect gave it a very Chinese name, Temple of Divine Flowers. This temple, with its unusual interior, became a great attraction, with many flocking to it to kneel and pray in front of an image of the Virgin Mary holding baby Jesus. At first, Father Ricci was surprised at their zeal, but he soon realized that the Chinese were mistaking the Virgin and Child for the Guan Yin the sun-giving goddess, whose image was commonly found in Buddhist temples. Some also thought the virgin and child were the Christian god. Father Ricci began to realize that spreading the Catholic faith among the masses in China would be harder than he had anticipated. Some of Father Ricci's new friends were literati and Confucian scholars. He came to realize that well-educated missionaries like himself had much in common with Chinese intellectuals. They could more easily build a rapport with them than with the masses. From then on, he shifted his proselytizing focus to literati and Confucian scholars. Confucian scholars enjoyed a lofty social status whereas skilled craftsmen did not. Making clocks and watches might arouse curiosity, but could exert no real influence on scholar officials or intellectuals. They might even take you for a simple craftsman. How then could they communicate on a deeper level with the Chinese intellectuals? Father Ricci's gift to the scholar officials would transform Chinese notions of geography. He drew a map of the world. It was the first of several increasingly detailed world maps that he would draw in China. During the 15th and 16th centuries, ships from Europe had made voyages of discovery all over the world in search of new trade routes and trading partners. They had discovered and mapped much that was previously unknown. Father Ricci's map of the world was a direct demonstration to the Chinese of the fruits of geographical discoveries by the West. To match the Chinese world view of China being at the center of the world, Father Ricci tactfully placed China in the center of the map. We're 他贴在这个肇庆寓所的那个墙上的那个世界地图 
偏向这个东边，所以中国人就是很不习惯，是吧？所以立马的就做一个妥协，就是把那个中国整个移移到中间来。The Chinese discovered from Father Ricci's map that the world was much larger than they had thought, and that China was only a part of it. They also learned that the ancient Chinese conception of a round sky and a square Earth was incorrect. It was the Earth that was round. Father Ricci's map became an important means for him to befriend Chinese scholar officials. 文明，它总是有先进、落后。当如果先进的东西进来的时候，比它所在一个这个所到的地方，比它更近先进的时候，那必然从来没有一个我们中国时代遗传到人家很好的知识，我们去反对。所以这时候就用文化上的优势，通过地理大发现，在西方科学技术上的优势来。From his first map of the world with Chinese annotations, to the complete terrestrial map, to his map of the myriad countries of the world, Father Ricci's maps ran through many editions and circulated all over China. They helped him strike up friendships with Chinese scholar officials interested in science. Despite their differences in culture and religion, Father Ricci reported to the Superior General of the Jesuits. You will be pleased to know that the Chinese place great importance on the map of the world. The prefect himself supervised its printing in his own residence, though he doesn't sell it. Rather, he gives it away as a precious gift to people of certain status. The chiming clock and the map of the world won Father Ricci great fame among scholar officials and opened the way for missionary work. Between 1583 and 1589. He converted 80 Chinese. His knowledge of China deepened during those six years. He himself became more Chinese in his grooming, attire, and the way he talked and behaved. But this policy of adapting to Chinese culture proved controversial. In other Asian countries, converts were expected to imitate Portuguese priests in formalities and in dress and grooming. The churches also had to be styled like those in Europe. The approach adopted by Father Ricci was criticised from within the church. Father Ruggieri returned to Rome to try to explain their strategy to the Holy See. However, four popes passed away in close succession, and Father Ruggieri himself finally passed away in Salerno. Matteo Ricci was left to work in China by himself, where he waited for the right opportunity to arise. Things took an even worse turn when the new prefect suddenly ordered Father Ricci to leave Zhaoqing. With his six years of hard work at an abrupt end, he was forced to relocate to Shaozhou. 过去很多学者，包括一些西方学者，都认为，立马都离开肇庆的一个很大的原因，就是因为当时官场的人事变动。That explanation is the one Father Ricci gave in his letters. However, newly discovered information suggests a hidden reason. This is the genealogy of a Shaozhou official from that time. It includes another explanation for Father Ricci's departure from Zhao Jing. 就是族谱里边有专门有一篇这个文章，就是题目就叫做《立马传》。写这个《立马传》的这个呃呃人呢，就是我的第十四世先祖，叫做刘承范。他呢，他当时就是韶关的同知。
The genealogy contains a 3,000 word record of Father Ricci's dealings with Liu Cheng Fan, who had been commissioned to investigate the activities of foreigners in Guangdong. Rampant piracy off its coast set the scene for a government operation to drive out foreigners. Naturally, Liu Cheng Fan would not have disclosed this to Father Ricci. But at the same time, he felt that Father Ricci posed no threat, so he simply exhorted him to leave Zhao Qing and head inland to Shaozhou. What could Father Ricci do now? He began to implement a new plan. First, he stopped wearing monastic robes. He grew his hair and beard and began dressing in the style of the Chinese literati. He began looking for opportunities to work his way north to Beijing and enlist the emperor's support for Catholicism. He was still sticking by his strategy of adapting to Chinese culture, but now he appeared as a scholar official. In the summer of 1595, he arrived in Nanchang, in Jiangxi province. This became his new base. A hundred kilometers from Nanchang was the famous Bailu Dong Academy, set in the forest on the south side of Wu Lao Fang Peak on Mount Lushan. It had been one of four great academies during the Northern Song Dynasty. By befriending scholars such as the great lecturer Zhang Huang. Father Ricci deepened his knowledge of Chinese culture. The idea of introducing Chinese culture to the West began to take root in his mind. In Nanchang, he witnessed an imperial examination attended by some 4,000 candidates. He had never seen anything like it. The imperial examination selected candidates for the civil service. During the Ming Dynasty, it was a three-tiered system of provincial, metropolitan, and palace exams. It was a public examination and selected candidates by merit. Father Ricci carefully documented the examination process and relayed it to his friends in Europe, where it was widely admired. The system of the exams è una delle cose che impressionò moltissimo soprattutto i, gli intellettuali illuministi e che fece dire loro che appunto la Cina era un paese governato, retto dai filosofi. Questo colpì prima di loro i gesuiti che eh, erano la fonte prima delle conoscenze sulla Cina in Europa, nell'Europa del, della fine del Seicento e del Settecento, che erano uomini di grande cultura e che avevano strutturalmente nel proprio DNA comunque un profondissimo rispetto per la cultura. Meanwhile, Confucian scholars were relishing works by Father Ricci. He wrote a book on friendship that quoted a hundred Western adages on this theme. As he noted in one of his letters, the book was very popular and helped establish his reputation in China. He was hailed as a talented scholar and a moral sage. He had come to China as a missionary, but his knowledge of Western science and technology made him the unconscious instrument of cultural exchange between East and West, opening up a two-way exchange between the civilizations. He Ruxi 
文人学者所了解。At this time, Father Ricci was given complete charge of all Jesuit activities in China. He grew even more intent on meeting the emperor. By 1599, he had moved to Nanjing. The residents were celebrating the Chinese New Year, but Father Ricci was not in the mood. His hopes of meeting the emperor had just been dashed. He had travelled with a friendly official to Tungzhou, near Beijing, but Japan had just invaded the Korean Peninsula, and it was impossible for foreigners to get permission to enter the city. He had no choice but to return to Nanjing. He had lived in mainland China for 15 years. He was now almost 50 and knew he had to make the best use of his remaining time. His new responsibilities also gave him a profound sense of mission. He felt he could only fulfill that mission by meeting the emperor. In 1600, on the eve of the 17th century, Father Ricci once again had an opportunity to go to Beijing. With great hope and confidence. He assembled his gifts for the emperor. He boarded a boat that was carrying silk and other tribute, and headed once again for Beijing. However, this journey proved the most challenging of all. Like all Jesuits and all Catholic priests, he had a crucifix with him. This everyday item aroused the suspicion of a eunuch. Believing that the crucifix would jinx the emperor, the eunuch had Father Ricci and his assistant thrown into prison. These repeated trials and tribulations brought even the strong-willed Ricci to the point of despair. There seemed to be no hope. But after he had languished in prison for about two months, there was good news. The inventory of his gifts had reached the imperial court, and the Wan Li Emperor had ordered that Father Ricci and his tribute be brought to the capital. The residents of Beijing were now making their own preparations for Chinese New Year, which would be not only the most festive day of the year, but also the first Chinese New Year of the 17th century. After 17 years, Father Ricci was finally in the heart of the imperial city that had so long been beyond his reach. Accompanied by top officials from the Ministry of Rights, he entered the Hall of Imperial Supremacy. There, to his astonishment. He found the throne empty. 当时的万历皇帝是属于代政期间，就是非常懒惰的一个皇帝。他不根本是不上朝，不接见任何大臣。If he couldn't meet the emperor, how could he expect to win the emperor's support? His only consolation was that once again his technology came to the rescue. The Wan Li Emperor showed not the slightest interest in his religious artifacts, but he was fascinated by the chiming clocks, one large and one small. The emperor ordered that a bell tower be built inside the palace to house the large chiming clock. He kept the small one for his own amusement. He was especially fond of this kind of novelty. And was worried that the Empress Dowager, his mother, would take his clock for herself. So when she asked to see the clock, the Emperor had the chiming function disabled. Growing bored with the clock that would not chime, she returned it to the Emperor. From then on, chimes from a Western clock sounded in the Imperial Palace. Ever since the arrival of the Jesuits. Collecting chiming clocks had become a hobby for both the nobility and commoners. Although they viewed the clocks mainly as complex novelties, 
that made a pleasing sound at regular intervals. The officials who resided in Beijing were very interested in Father Ricci's prism. They were fascinated by the oddly shaped optical instrument and its rays, even if none of them understood what it was for. Among Father Ricci's tribute was a map of the world. It was of less interest to the emperor and the bureaucrats. But the Europe that sat on the edge of the map they neglected was undergoing a major transition. Starting from the 17th century, productivity was unleashed and science and technology developed rapidly. Europe was entering modernity. World maps, chiming clocks and tiny prisms all reflected the new era of development in Europe. But none of it was apparent to anyone in China, from commoners to scholar officials, all the way to the emperor. Their appreciation of Western objects and instruments was limited to their novelty. China,在阳明学盛行的时代,可能好谈哲理的东西。在哲理那个风潮过去之后, 如果讲究实的话，他可能会去考虑的是经史之类的东西，他未必会钻研到具体的那种科学技术层面去。The religious objects that Father Ricci had presented failed to attract any attention. It became clear that the idea of converting the emperor to Catholicism would never be realized. Father Ricci admitted in a letter that the path of mission in China would be long and arduous. The time of our presence in China is far from the time for harvest, nor is it even the time for sowing. We are merely pioneers who clear thick bushes and pull out toxic weeds to make way for sowing and harvesting by others. Of course, Father Ricci was not completely without success. The Emperor's fondness for the chiming clocks won him the privilege of living in Beijing. The clocks became his link with the Emperor as he was summoned to court on many occasions to repair them. As the clocks ticked away, five years went by. Father Ricci was granted permission to build a chapel inside Shunwu Gate, one of the three southern gates of the inner city. Today, the same site hosts the Cathedral of the Immaculate Conception, also known locally as the South Church. The original chapel was built in 1601, after Father Ricci bought the land for 500 tails of gold. In 1605, he rebuilt it as a full church, as the first Catholic church building in Beijing, it reflected his firm foothold there. Father Ricci was in Beijing for a long time. His position was very different from the previous position. It was the Father who allowed them to be in Beijing. If you allow the officials, the officials of course, even if they want to be in Beijing, Social whining and dining three or four times a day was commonplace in the lives of the Ming elite. Father Ricci led a very busy life in Beijing. He became acquainted with scholar officials of all sorts, including the men who would be known as the three pillars of Chinese Catholicism, Xu Guangqi, Li Zhecao, and Yang Tingyun. The erudite Xu Guangqi, author of a complete treatise on agriculture, spent a great deal of time discussing Western knowledge with Father Ricci and helping him translate Western texts into Chinese. Their most important translation was Euclid's Elements, 
which was instrumental in the development of mathematics in China. Much of its terminology is still used today. During his years in China, Father Ricci also studied other disciplines, such as optics, astronomy, and geology. The Jesuits brought large quantities of books from Europe, introducing new findings in science and technology. Studies show that the Jesuits in China translated over 400 books, more than half of which were on the social and natural sciences. Some of them can still be found in Chinese libraries. The introduction of Western knowledge to the East, set in motion by Father Ricci, had a profound influence on Chinese culture, reaching into fields such as astronomy, mathematics, geography, the calendar, mechanics, art, music and language. It gave the Chinese a first taste of the achievements of the West since the Renaissance. Father Ricci was also fascinated by the Chinese culture. He had intended to translate the Confucian five classics and four books into Western languages. But in the end, he was only able to translate the four books into Latin. Other Jesuits also introduced the language, history, and various systems of China to the West. These works marked the beginning of Sinology as a discipline in Europe. È molto interessante il importanza e il ruolo che finirono per avere le traduzioni dei più che di Matteo Ricci direttamente dell'entourage di Matteo Ricci e soprattutto direi di Prospero in Torcetta, le traduzioni dei testi classici confuciani o di parte di questi testi. Eh, questo fu molto importante soprattutto nella fase dell'illuminismo perché eh, la immagine che della Cina che emergeva da questi testi era un'immagine di un paese eh, governato dai saggi e governato dai filosofi. On the 17th of February, 1609, the 57-year-old Matteo Ricci wrote the last of his letters that still survives today. In it, he reflected on his missionary work. In this mission field, with the mighty help of the Lord. I have tried my best, and yet the results have been unremarkable. We need more missionaries as the field is simply too vast. At the end of last year, it suddenly occurred to me that I was the sole survivor of the first group of missionaries to China. Apart from me, no one else knows how Catholicism came into China. One year later, Matteo Ricci fell gravely ill. The Jesuit priest, who was most like a Confucian scholar, finished his earthly journey on the 11th of May, 1610. In the 10 years that he lived in Beijing, he was seen by the emperor as an imperial clock artisan. His great regret was not having the opportunity to realize the grand preaching mission of the Society of Jesus. However, perhaps it ought to have pleased him still more that the Jesuit missionaries helped build a bridge between the European and Chinese civilizations. Through mutual communication and understanding, these priests left behind the precious cultural heritage in both China and Europe. Ninety-five years after the passing of Matteo Ricci, 
the debates surrounding the accommodation policy for preaching in China reached boiling point, culminating in 1705 with the Kangxi Emperor banning foreign missionaries. The window of East-West communication was closed. This is an old cemetery located outside the Fuchun Gate. Its most eye-catching gravestone combines Western and Eastern elements. Carved in stone above the white marble headstone is the name of Jesus in the midst of a coiled dragon. The headstone, silent though it is, tells the story of the legendary Matteo Ricci, the missionary to China. This was the burial ground granted to Father Ricci by the Wan Li Emperor. Later, it became the common graveyard for foreign missionaries who passed away in Beijing. Other famous Jesuits buried here include Johann Adam Schall von Bell, Ferdinand Febist, and Giuseppe Castiglioni. They preached, they spread cultural understanding, and some assisted with colonial expansion. All of them came to China and invested their lives and dreams in this ancient land.